and program on Other Than Internet 24 is classified MA. It is intended for adults and may be unsuitable for children under 17. It may contain crude and decent language, explicit sexual activity, graphic violence, or political ideology. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. The following program contains opinions of the participants and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Veterna Media Network. The network believes in a safe space for all ideas to be expressed without any censorship and on its duty to create such a platform for free speech. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. Skyrocketing prices. Sri Lanka's economic crisis, which stemmed soon after unpegging the rupee, has now escalated to levels unthinkable, unimaginable, unfathomable. Sri Lankans across the nation are asking the very same question. How can we live like this? On another side, many are taking advantage of this crisis and they too are trying to milk a buck off the already suffering people. That's just here at home. Beyond the shows, Canadians are trampling this battered nation further, showcasing a new trend that might pop up if we do not do according to what they say. To make heads or tails on this conundrum, tonight I'm joined by the Chairman of the Consumer Affairs Authority, Shantan Niriyalla, Professor and Research Fellow of the International Centre for Interdisciplinary Research in Law at the Laurentian University of Canada, Professor Neville Hevage and Minister of Foreign Affairs Ali Sabri. Good evening, I'm Mahesh Johnny, and this is the State of the Nation. Well, once again, good to see you everyone. Thank you very much for taking the time to check us out this week as well. As always, there's a lot to discuss, so let's get right to it. Well, in my opinion, Sri Lanka is in debt, declared bankrupt and in default. The scenario has enabled and facilitated the rollout of many agendas simultaneously. Now, when a country is weak and vulnerable, all the vultures come out. Despite that, it is also an excellent time to look at the situation head on, identify the issues and think of solutions. Can Sri Lanka do so? Can we think differently and get out of this crisis by ourselves? Once again, like week after week, I raise this, are we going to do more of the same? There are many solutions Sri Lanka can think of in order to get out of this crisis. But thanks to the uh, liberal think tanks who claim to be doctors, proctors and professors, uh, yet all of what they are is a bunch of jokers, Thanks to them, day in and day out, we are chanting the IMF Gathava. The IMF Deyo is holding carrots in exchange for cutting the service sector and increasing taxes. But has the IMF placed a condition like demanding that politicians cut their perks and privileges or recover unpaid taxes from the top corporates? Why do they always insist on cutting the health benefits of the poor? education for the impoverished, and other social welfare measures for low-income families. Now, as of today, people's salaries are trimmed by taxes, making them look or for alternative options, resulting in leaving jobs, flying overseas, selling their property, and taking their money out of this country. This will undoubtedly lead to the collapse of the public and private sectors. How many of us have honestly thought about the outcome of such a scenario, what will happen to the banks, the small and medium enterprises, enterprise sector and other local industries in this country, which in my opinion is the backbone of our nation. Now people are selling their land, property and leaving the country. Who is buying these lands? Foreigners or lo locals as fronts for foreigners? Where will this end up for a sovereign state? with regard to the credit lines. As of now, we see a lot of investment by India in the country and many key businesses being pawned off to our Navy in the North. This will give India the upper hand to dictate how Sri Lanka is governed. 
where will this lead to? Do we elect politicians to parliament and watch them live a life of luxury, yet meekly consent to do all that foreign nations demand of them to do? And of course, we have to talk about the US influence on our people and our sovereignty. We have seen the manner that the educated community in Sri Lanka were easily drawn to the streets while an educated society looked on. The violence instigated probably by people given drugs or alcohol, but cheered by the educated to commit the rampage they did. All hallmarks of Western funded regime change and protests. We've seen this similar pattern in Arab, in Egypt, in Venezuela, and parts of China recently. Yet despite all that, it was framed as the protest of the people, led by many who claim to be intellectual. Why did those educated couldn't come up with alternative plans to solve the problem? Using organizations and political parties funded by external sources, they have penetrated into universities and have subtly brainwashed the youth of our country. They made, they made uh, being patriotic sound to be something so old and demeaning and not of the modern world. That narrative is very important to, up, to be upheld by these puppet masters. Because just imagine if all Sri Lankans do truly love their country, can the puppet masters do what they want to do here? Entry of drugs into the school systems is also not being addressed properly. And the police are being humiliated and demoralized alongside the military. Areas where the foundation of law and order is now targeted. The manner that the police and armed forces are being attacked using uh, hired media personnel and NGOs as well showcases where the ultimate goal is. Corrupting society is being rolled out by attempting to bring in ideology where they try to create a society who do not value traditional and culture and drawn to embrace cult fantasies that lead them to eventually become depressed, psychologically weak, and physically abused. And if you think about it, they are all ingredients for the pharmaceutical industry to create customers for life. With Sri Lanka in a weak and vulnerable state, the crusaders of dividing Sri Lanka have come out again to seek separation via renewed slogans that have the nod of approval of their sponsors, for it enables them to advance their agenda, piggybacking on the local demands. It is a pity that the mainstream media is playing the fiddle to the primarily because they are part of that more significant agenda. Today only a handful are able to see the larger picture at play. Having watched how other nations have fallen and the cut and paste similarities taking place in Sri Lanka. This is why some educated seem not to understand the importance of history as those who forget or ignore history are bound to repeat it, or in Sri Lanka's game, case, become victims of it. The bottom line is that this is our nation. Everyone should feel that it is our nation and wish to protect and preserve it. We are too small of a nation to have been prostituted and used as a battering ram as it has happened since 1505. The problems we are in right now does not need solutions from beyond our shores. We already know what needs to be done. The only problem is that we, as people of this country, are divided. Until we understand that this Sri Lanka is yours and mine. This Sri Lanka is a land that you and I need to fight for. This Sri Lanka is a land that will bring out the best of each and every citizen and that we can make this the greatest country in the world. Up until that time, all what we have is an opportunity at hand. If neglected, that will be soon be lost. We'll be right back.
Welcome back everyone, this is the State of the Nation. Recently, I was having dinner with my mother and she went on a lamenting trip complaining about how prices of certain items uh, keeps changing. I think she was complaining about uh, coconut prices, which keeps changing all the time. She told me that even in the big supermarkets in Colombo, you go today and they will sell you a coconut, let's say 450 rupees. I do not know exact the uh, accurate price right now, but let's say for, for, uh, for argument's sake, 150 rupees and you go to the same place tomorrow, it will be 160. Did the coconut gods impose a tax overnight uh, for those prices to fluctuate? Now, it is very unfair to the consumers. Yes, certain elements cannot be controlled when someone depends on many services to bring them to the market. It will change. But it's very unfair to the consumer to charge them different prices within a few days for the same product without giving them a proper reasonable answer. Now take the electronic market. We all know the skyrocketing prices of certain electronic products. They imported to Sri Lanka at a nominal rate before the economic crisis. No sooner the rupee crash without notice or reasonable explanation as to how the prices of products which they already have brought into the country by paying the old price and then charging new rates based on the latest exchange rate, which would not affect their profit margin whatsoever, but increase it massively. These dishonest businessmen took advantage and pinned everything, saying economic crisis. Is this fair? Are you okay with it? Our cameras managed to roam the streets of Colombo, and this is what some of you had to say. Uh, well, uh, we have no choice. We have to tie up our belts and we have reduced uh, using the items. So most of the items uh, we tend to buy only the essential items, which especially for children. So we have cut off uh, our expenses and uh, actually we are buying on monthly basis. So we have uh, drastically reduced the number of items and the quantities that we are buying on monthly basis. That's a Exactly, no, because yeah. there are relevant authorities who should be responsible for these things, but they are not taking up those uh, responsibilities in a correct manner, I think. It's miserable, you know, you are totally confused when you go into a shop because you never know what price they will say. You get one price in the item and when you go to the system, system indicates another price and you know, it's just the chaos, it's severe chaos. So I think there should be a price control somewhere, whether it's high or low, it doesn't matter. But it should be a fixed price so that the people won't get lost. For loans, interest also got higher. Mm, but so our income not good. Definitely need uh, control. Control not for general people. They should do government. Actually, uh, all uh, families uh, at the moment we are struggling to. Uh, um, maintain our day-to-day -day lifestyle. When it comes to bread, uh, so that is the very good, very best example. And in some places it's 180 and 150. Uh, so, uh, so that is the very best example which I comes to my, which comes to my mind uh, at the very first time. So, uh, so it really affects our day-to-day -day lives and uh, like when it comes to like uh, we are budgeting for the month as well. So uh, it really affects uh, that like uh, so not directly, actually when pa planning for our other expenses also, uh, so it, it applies uh, for the, like, the other goods as well. Earlier we could buy, you know, four or five uh, shopping bags, fu goods full of, uh, for 5,000 rupees. Now for 5,000 rupees it has gone down to two uh, bags. I think because of that, like, uh, most of the ground levels are suffering and also the middle level people. And that's why most of the people are protesting and uh, raising their voices. So where can you turn when issues like these exist? Those days uh, we were able to complain to the Consumer Affairs Authority, the legal arm of the Sri Lankan government, to ensure that uh, consumers of this country are not scammed. Today, looking at how things are happening, I honestly do not know whom to complain. Now, if you go to the website of the Consumer Affairs Authority in their overview of that organization, it says, and I quote, Consumer Affairs Authority is the apex government uh, organization mandated to protect consumer interest and ensure fair market competition in Sri Lanka. So basically, they have to look 
uh, the prices of uh, commodities in the market and ensure that you, the consumers, are not being ripped off by these vendors. Now, to get an understanding of what these prices are, I also sent my good friend Danid Vitanavasam to check the prices around in Colombo and he joins me now from the data board. Uh, Danid, good to see you once again. Um, I also uh, I, I understand that you went around in Colombo, went into certain shops, certain supermarkets, trying to figure out what the prices are and everybody was looking at you in a weird way because you were not buying anything. You were a very suspicious uh, 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 person. Uh, entering these uh, institutions and trying to figure out what's going on. What did you learn? Well, firstly, Mahesh, the good news is that we see that the supermarket security system is quite accurate. They know what they're doing and they will. They are in the outlook to see if anyone's trying to audit the place. Uh, <laughs> now, towards a bit of bad news, uh, we see that given the inflation rates that we have been covering on a daily basis within uh, within this program as well, uh, we. Uh, these were exclusively looked at for the 20th of January, the prices that existed on 20th of January, and exclusively in supermarkets. Now, we took a few key commodities. Rice, in this case, will be the samba rice that is being consumed by majority of people. One coconut, meaning per coconut the rate, and the milk powder that tastes for 200 grams. These are the general major cons consumer products, and these are also covered by the central bank in terms of daily rates that have been governed. We see that the fluctuation here hasn't been too great. Uh, hasn't been too great within the past few weeks. We see that there has been a consistency in one kilogram of rice being at 230 rupees, in one coconut being between a range of 109 to 110, and milk powder going at between 1,190 to 1,240. Now, just to uh, take your, uh, the, the protein elements, I think this is where some of the uh, criticism has exactly risen. Fresh milk, uh, one would say has uh, stayed within the range of between 460 to 490. Now here, I believe even, even with this program, we have argued the issue of why can't we move into fresh milk completely and not take in milk powder because we see that if we look at the segments where we don't have to import, this is one area that we can really capitalize on. Chicken, one kilogram, and eggs, which have been like the primary protein source for children and for a lot of young adults, has been an area where we have seen an increase in fluctuation. Now here, Mahesh, we've seen that there has been a conversation about eggs that have been released from the central bank to be at between 55 and 56. But in the supermarket, we see the price between, six, uh, between 65 and 66, that is uh, for a 10 pack, that it will be about 650 per pack. So we see that there's a huge discrepancy when it comes to the prices of these protein products. Over to you, Mahesh. Um, Narindu, I don't know whether you remember, but uh, there was a time period when this whole economic crisis started coming in. There was a, uh, a humanitarian organization, uh, I think part of the UN, um, they were trying to say, you know, oh my God, uh, Sri Lankan uh, children do not have enough ham, enough bacon, enough cheese to eat, and because of the economic crisis, uh, they're suffering. Uh, because. Uh, that particular organization was trying to tell the world. I don't. I, I think they were trying to milk some money out of it. Or, or don't know whether you know how my, uh, our people don't have cheese. It's not as if most of the uh, children in this country do not consume those kinds of products on a daily basis. Maybe that is considered to be a luxury product. Uh, I did you find out exactly what those prices are in terms of? Uh, you know, the current current margin, with the can, can, can that be afforded by a bougie, you know, posh, posh families uh, who are apparently saying they, are, they too are going through all this, you know, economic crisis? Yeah, uh, I think more than anything, it shows the mismatch between what these organizations know and what the situation is on the ground. But uh, assuming that you'd ask a similar question, we just had a look at one of these, uh, you know, the, the bourgeoisie kind of uh, items, cheese, retains its price as between 1,390 and 1,930, uh, just for anyone who needs to know. Bacon at 655, I believe these were two of the elements that were saying, okay, look, the children need these two elements specifically uh, for their growth and for their intake. And I believe, uh, if Mahesh, you recall, uh, they actually had a picture of a child, I believe, saying, you know, this is a victim of not having enough cheese uh, to, to eat. I think, again, it's a very elitist comment to be made. Again, if someone is uh, interested in the apple prices, green apple still goes at between 240 <laughs> to 235, red between 240 to 219. Sausages between 400 to 700. Again, supermarket prices for anyone who is interested. Yeah, um, I tend to think that our program is as such that we cater to all the audience. So there are the prices for all those products. Thank you very much.
Now let's get some answers to this issue and for that I'm now joined by the Chairman of the Consumer Affairs Authority, Shant Niriyala. Thank you very much sir for joining me, I appreciate your time. So now, as you know, since the economic crisis began, there has been a massive uh, fluctuation of prices in daily commodities people use. Now, today, if you take uh, the prices of eggs, for an example, we just showed it uh, uh, on the data board, uh, we saw that despite what the government says, vendors are deciding their own prices and changing them daily, which is not fair uh, for the consumer. Now, who is looking after the consumer and where can they turn to for some fairness? Now, uh, well, uh, Maisha, now, uh, as you said now, it is the consumer's authority uh, uh, who can look after the rights of the consumers in Sri Lanka. Uh, also, that uh, you mentioned about the egg prices. Uh, to control the egg prices, we imposed MRP on eggs a uh, couple of months back. It is in August um, to control the egg prices because we, we knew and uh, we had a market survey. We found that egg prices were uh, going up without any very reason. Uh, un, uh, it is it is not fair uh, hike of uh, prices. So that uh, we uh, uh, we had a couple of discussions, couple of round discussions with all stakeholders uh, before we imposed uh, uh, MRP on the eggs. Uh, but ultimately, we found that uh, uh, the prices uh, hike uh, price hike was uh, very unfair and uh, it has to be uh, controlled. Uh, that is why we imposed uh, uh, MRP, which means uh, maximum retail price on eggs. Uh, by way of uh, gazette notification, ultimately, uh, it has been challenged uh, by the uh, producers and manufacturers in the court of law. And this uh, gazette notification has been temporarily suspended pending the final determination. Uh, so uh, uh, after, after that, you can see the prices of eggs are going high. And uh, to there, there is no shortage in the market uh, of eggs, but uh, as you mentioned right now, uh, the prices of eggs are uh, going up. But, but uh, there is a mechanism to, uh, there, the government is seeking a mechanism to uh, control this price hike uh, and the trade minister has already taken a decision to import eggs and uh, fill this gap in the market. So thereby, uh, the consumer will be protected or uh, the eggs prices will be gone down in due course. Well, um, as I mentioned, uh, sir, many uh, changes occurred uh, after the financial crisis hit in, in this country. And now, how are you bringing back quality checks and holding vendors accountable for malpractice, thereby building confidence in the public? Look, <coughs> malpractices and the, the, there's a quality control. You mean that? Uh, uh, now that uh, we know that uh, all the uh, traders and producer, producers are selling their own products and there may be uh, uh, instances where uh, the products are not up to the standard. You can see in the market some products holds the mark of SLSI uh, where it is necessary and it has been mandatory. Uh, some products it is not available but the consumer anticipate that the product is uh, uh, up to the standard and it is uh, uh, it is suitable for consumption. So that is why the, uh, the consumer purchase or consume uh, all these uh, uh, commodities. So if there are any uh, loopholes in this uh, standard, they can complain to the consumer's authority uh, and we can carry out a, a research and a, a laboratory test over, over that product. Uh, and we can uh, take necessary legal actions against the persons or the trader or the vendor or the manufacturer uh, who, uh, for, who keep this uh, product for uh, sale in the market. Mr. Niriala, let me be blunt and ask you, do trade unions and other business uh, societies pressuring your authority to retain high prices and not consider the consumer? It is, my uh, uh, this is uh, actually it is very, very good question. The consumer, consumer affairs authority is uh, an independent entity. There is no influence by any party, but we are empowered by act to call all these stakeholders or the producers or manufacturers, any vendor uh, who produce uh, uh, consumer commodities and have discussions over these issues whenever the issues arises. 
uh, as for an example when the prices are going up uh, or the, uh, the, the it is the producers who keep the fix the MRP on their own products so we have advised all these manufacturers and producers to keep a record as to how they uh, uh, arrive this MRP it has to be reasonable so any, there is no influence by any other party or the, any, any outsider uh, to the activities of the uh, consumer, consumer affairs authority. Uh, so we are independent and we are doing our uh, maximum to, the safe, uh, to, to safeguard the rights of the consumers of Sri Lanka. Indeed. Um, all right. We have to leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much. That was the chairman of the Consumer Affairs Authority, Shant Nirial. Uh, we're going to take a short commercial break. On the other side, Canada is fast. Is it fast becoming the 51st state of the United States of America? Because they tend to be acting like the U.S. Ambassador Julie Chung. Back in a moment. This is State of the Nation. Recently, Canada imposed sanctions on two Sri Lankan former presidents and two military personnel. As much as the Colombo Liberals are joyously celebrating this fact by trying to say that it's only on just two individuals, you really need to wake up. These two presidents who were given sanctions, despite both are not popular in the Colombo radical liberal circles, those two are pertinent to this country winning its war against the worthless ruthless, spineless terrorist organization, the LTTE. Their leadership and our heroic military's uh, commitment is the reason Sri Lanka is a free nation. So if you are thinking, oh no, these sanctions are only on two individuals, not on Sri Lanka as a state, which is what the liberal clowns are funneling these days to make you believe that bull, so you don't get rattled. The reality is as such, this is the beginning of bigger things to come. The next will be, for sure, be the rest of the country. Just imagine if we as a nation collectively elected someone the LTT lovers in Canada hate and do not want, they will for sure push their government to impose sanctions. Please get this straight. The LTTE lovers in Canada who are angry that their loving leader Prabhakaran was killed by a heroic forces do not care about the Tamil people in Sri Lanka. They don't give a damn. All they want is to see Sri Lanka broken into two and that Tamil Leelam is becoming a reality. It looks like the Canadian government is leading the way. I can hear the Colombo Twitter liberals uh, chanting the claims of Onnakoti Nagitinamo claim, just to be cynical, at the fact that when an election is close by, patriotic community use this line as a scare tactic. But you really need to think as to why, when something like this comes up, why are they bring, uh, being pushed by these uh, NGOs and the rest of the Western clan to hold the elections? There's also the question as to why the government of uh, Sri Lanka didn't do anything to counter these fake allegations against a sovereign nation. Last week in the State of the Nation podcast, Dr. Pratima Mahanamaheva, who was uh, our former Human Rights Commissioner and an individual who uh, fought in Geneva, New York and the rest of the world, for, uh, for to create actually the true voice of Sri Lanka gave us an indication as to why the government of Sri Lanka was not interested in supporting this voice. When we were actually fighting for our country, the United Nations Human Rights Council representative, one of the famous cricket commentator, he never gave a glass of water for us, but they all gave for the LTT supporters, yeah. those who are coming they from had a party. Sri Lanka. And, because I, I, I want to tell this truth. We were yeah. crying. We were crying, but they never cared. 
they show their backside to us that's so this is so the sri lankan embassy sri lankan permanent representative office in geneva 2018 in october i'm telling if not asked from the other souls they had nice dinner dance dinner parties for whom the ltt supporters. propaganda supporters so we are actually fighting for what finally we think unitary we fight but we need some agreement with the government otherwise i'll tell give ltt all the powers <laughs> give give transnational my we have to try yeah, that also yeah, give yeah. give transnational government ask uh, rudra kumar to come and uh, you yeah. know administer this country Well, that was uh, Dr. Pratibha Mahanama, uh, former Human Rights Commissioner of Sri Lanka. Now, let's get more into this story. Joining me now is uh, adjunct professor and research fellow of the International Center for Interdisciplinary Research uh, in uh, Law at the Laurentian University of Canada, Professor Neville Havergay. He joins me now from Ottawa, Canada, via Zoom. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for your time. Um, now, what amazes me, Professor, is when there are so much of negatory views being mentioned in Canada about Sri Lanka, the LTT propaganda has successfully managed to creep into the political branches and the hierarchy of Canada and is changing the narrative of the war fought by our war heroes to bring victory into this country. Now, what's happening in terms of the people, especially the Sri Lankan community, who are opposing this? I'm sure you all are not getting a good image due to these uh, sanctions. How exactly are you fighting uh, back against this LTT terrorist propaganda? Thank you very much, Mahesh, uh, for inviting me for this interview. And uh, that is a great question. But I do see there is a lot of moving elements uh, within inside the uh, your question. Um, I think I will narrow down to three parts. First part is that uh, uh, Canada's position about the san- uh, sanctions. Canada is to get used to enforce the sanctions the, if they think there is a human rights violations. in other part of the world and they impose the sanction based on the three categories and they are using three instruments one is the united nation act then other one is the special economic measures act then the, our a third uh, instrument they are using justice for victims of corrupt foreign official act so what for this particular case canada has used just uh, special economic Measures Act to implement the sanction against the uh, few individuals in Sri Lanka. Now, uh, so this is the legal instrument uh, Canada has been used. So now we need to find out on what ground Canada has uh, decided to enforce sanction against these individuals. These individuals they identify as. Uh, Uh, political figures and military figures and military administration figures so that's how we need to narrow down the that question and answer that political figures is uh, directly connected to the former uh, president uh, uh, mahindra rajapaksha then other individuals are uh, uh, gotabaya rajapaksha at that time he was a defense secretary and other two individuals are military involvement uh, military person now uh, we need to find out on what ground on what ground they have implemented that question uh, that uh, the, the the sanction that the minister is thinking there is a reasonable uh, satisfied that there is a reasonable ground to believe that context is not the so uh, very powerful and the uh, threshold value is very low then the ministry is thinking there is a reasonable ground to believe so now we need to identify why minister is thinking there is a reasonable ground to believe but this is the place is going to claim that the ltt connection between the their propaganda now i need to identify what is the ltt propaganda ltt propaganda we identified as a three main uh, folds three folds first fold is that Tamil are innocent victims of the government dominated by Sinhalese. Second one is the Sri Lankan Tamils, constituting 12.5 of the population, are subject to constant discrimination and military oppression. The Tamils can never peacefully coexist with the Sinhalese in single state. So those are the three main elements we identify throughout their campaign. This is uh, this is a very co- uh, very. Consi- uh, 
constant from the beginning. So now we need to find out Tamils are innocent victim of government dominated single state. Before that is now is uh, now I want to connect this statement to the directly to the sanction. Sanction is uh, implemented as an example. I, I mentioned that political figure. One of the political figure is the uh, president uh, uh, Mahindra Rajapaksha. Now their propaganda is directly connected with the political figure. So which is it confirmed that this is a part of the LTT campaign. Then second issue I need to identify what is their second propaganda campaign. Second element of their propaganda campaign is that Tamils uh, uh, are subjected to constant discrimination and military oppression. So in that case, they had to connect the military personnel to this uh, the particular issue. So therefore, sanction against for the two military personnel and attached to the former defense secretary is directly connected with the LTT propaganda. So this is the threshold value so we can establish at, at the beginning, before answer this question, the sanctions are behind directly influenced by the LTT propaganda. It is reasonable uh, ground for me to believe it is the LTT propaganda. Understood, uh, Professor. Now, these sanctions were only imposed on four individuals. Now, in your opinion, is that is this the start of a bigger process of sanctioning? Perhaps Canadians might be blind and deaf to the truth that they um, might single-handedly implement and achieve what Prabhakaran failed in his military quest. Yes, that's correct. Uh, but Canada, uh, in my view, uh, when you look at the whole process, sanction process, and for the legal procedure process, Canada balanced the damage, very well balanced the damage with the foreign affairs with Sri Lanka. So Canada would have implemented this uh, sanction against these four individuals, especially uh, concern is that uh, President uh, uh, Gotabe Rajapaksha, when he was in power, and the Mahindra Rajapaksha was in power. But Canada doesn't want to do that because it will risk the diplomatic uh, relation between the two countries. Canada very well balanced. and But they did, the, they brought this san uh, sanction after that uh, Gotabe Rajpaksha was outset for the government and uh, Mahindra Rajpaksha also outset the government. So now we have another question coming into play. Who are the people who behind the campaign that we call so-called Aragalia, who behind to outset this individual? Then now it can be con connected that because of they outset the individual as a purpose of the, to, to bring them a sanction on Canada. Uh, 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 according to the, my review and my analysis with the in the policy analysis and uh, in the region, I'm pretty sure if the LTT propaganda and LTT element and anyhow they influence the government and they will not say they will they cannot bring the sanction against the uh, president and prime minister of the another country that is the reason they want to outset this both two individuals then after that they brought the sanction against this uh, individual and it will open the pathway for canada to enforce the sanction so therefore it is now very clear connection and aragalia behind also run by this uh, ltt propaganda ltt propaganda so therefore, it is the, against the country, and that's what they are going to do. So now uh, we need to identify and uh, how the Canada balanced the situation. Uh, so they they put the you know three million uh, donation uh, support for the Canada. Then after that, they enforce the sanction. Yeah. Understood, uh, Professor. And now I want to revisit something you uh, said prior. Uh, you said that the LTTE propaganda arm could have funded the Aragale. Can you elaborate on that, Professor? Uh, but actually, I do. Uh, I do connected the the dots about this incident because the san sanctions behind uh, with the uh, political figures, uh, two one political figure and the other three defense. Because the LTT propaganda campaign is mainly first fold of the analysis is Tamil sign is a victim of the dominant uh, dominated single is government. So the government component is connected with the president uh, Mahindra Rajapaksha. Then after that, they, they say subject to constant discrimination with the military oppression. So therefore, it is connected with the directly LTT propaganda, the, the second uh, threshold value, uh, second fold value uh, with the uh, military oppression. 
Now, in order to bring the sanction against these two individuals, uh, these individuals, what they quoted, the president and the defense official, former president and the defense official, government is, Canada is not going to impose the sanction against the uh, currently, they if they are in power. It is, I'm pretty sure, 100% that is the government policy and it will add the more problem with the diplomatic circles and they're dealing with the government relations. So therefore, they import the sanction after once they outset from the government. So in that case, I'm pretty sure it is It is very, uh, I have a very strong, uh, same as Melanie Jolly, prime, uh, foreign minister said, he has a strong, uh, reasonable ground to believe for this individual involved for uh, this uh, uh, humanitarian uh, uh, issues. Then I also have a very strong, reasonable ground to believe this Argale was the main important item is to outset the two, uh, two, uh, two elements of the uh, LTT propaganda. One is the former president, uh, uh, the Mahindra Rajapaksha. Second element is the military figure, uh, Gotabe Rajapaksha. And then after that, they outset the people from the government. Then they came back again to the uh, government of Canada and said, okay, now they are not in power. Please bring the sanction. So we can uh, the clearly... Uh, connected that one, uh, connected uh, issue, because this sanction came on 2023, January 6. After we have completed everything, countries back to normal, settled down, everybody for forget the Mahindra Rajapaksha, everybody forget the Gotabe Rajapaksha, they are not in power, and now they brought the sanction. That's how my uh, analysis. Yes, indeed. A uh, lot to think about. Uh, thank you very much. That was uh, Professor Neville Hevage, a joint professor and research fellow of the International Center for Interdisciplinary Research in Law at the Laurentian University in Canada. A small break and on the other side, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Ali Sabri, joins me to answer why the truth is not being pushed through our embassy network worldwide. We'll be right back. Welcome back everyone, this is the State of the Nation. Uh, we were talking about how the LTTE propaganda has been very effective in places like Canada, which has clearly ignored any evidence and has purely gone with words of terrorist sympathizers and is acting based on that. Now, earlier, we spoke to uh, a professor who explained how the LTTE propaganda network has been very effective in its messaging, even though we managed to defeat them militarily here. Joining me now uh, is Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ali Sabri. Thank you very much, sir, for your time. Uh, good to see you once again. Um, Minister, we are speaking at a time when two of Sri Lanka's former presidents, along with a couple of military personnel, have been sanctioned by a foreign state. Now, one such individual, former President Mahindra Rajapaksa, who is still part of your government, uh, basically Canada has imposed sanctions on an active parliamentarian. Just tell me, Minister, are you happy with this decision by Canada, despite it's not being one of Sri Lanka, uh, despite it not being on Sri Lanka, but on four Sri Lankans? Yeah, thank you, Mahesh, for having me. Uh, definitely, we are not. Uh, if you'd have followed the news and what has been transpired since then, we have strongly opposed this decision and lodged our protest. And we have called the or summoned the rather the acting high commissioner and lodged our protest to them. I have written to the foreign minister himself and foreign ministry had uh, already uh, given a strong uh, statement on this. So we are engaging them and our high commissioner also had gone and engaged with them. So I have kept uh, Honorable Mahinda Rajapaksha informed this and then uh, we are working uh, in tandem uh, to do this. But uh, the challenges are enormous. You know these are basically domestic compulsion uh, for politics in that country. Minister, I understand what you're saying, but is that enough saying that we are displeased by Canada's decision? Are we in such a feeble state that we just have to meekly tell Canada, thank you for the sanction, but we are not happy 
and move past that? Are we not doing anything beyond that? So what do you mean by that? What is beyond that? We, that those are the things diplomatically we can do. So the, these are complicated decision making. There are a lot of uh, uh, behind the scene discussions are taking place uh, as a government. And we, um, you need to understand that there are 500,000 Sri Lankans living in that country, uh, probably officially about 300 uh, to 500,000 people. So we need to look at them and these are important decisions. So everybody understand that including the former presidents. Uh, so we need to carefully look at it uh, and continue to engage with them uh, in a practical way. But in the meantime, there are limitations of course for us. So we have to uh, face the might uh, of a huge population there. Some of them are politically motivated. It's four or five uh, diplomats, uh, both in Ontario uh, and in Toronto. So these are challenges, of course, uh, ma uh, massive challenges, but uh, within our uh, uh, strength and, and within our limitations, we are doing what we could uh, do the best. Understood, uh, Minister, on another topic. Uh, why is this government neglecting China? Are you effectively moving away from China and aligning Sri Lanka with the US and the West? Uh, I don't think that's a fair question at all. Uh, we are, we are, uh, we, we have totally and reiterated our position that we are friend for all, enmity to none. Our policy is non aligned. In fact, the West and the, some others think that the other way around, that we are aligning towards China. So this is the perception issue, but we are working with them. And everybody is interested, uh, important for Sri Lanka. Every country, Chinese investment, export to the West, regional security and support of the Indians, all are part of uh, the whole thing. So the international relationship is a complicated thing in a globalized society. So we are certainly not staying away from China. China is our great friend for a long, long period of time. We have had great relationship with them. Uh, right now we are still discussing and this is the time that we are looking at uh, China more than anyone else because uh, we, it is important, it is paramount that China and all our, our major creditors give debt assurances for us to go to the IMF and so that it will become the first step towards debt restructuring and rewinding our entire economy and rebooting it. So therefore, China is a very important partner for us, long-standing friend and ally. There is no question of sidelining or staying away from China. In fact, we want to make better friendship with all the West, the Middle East, the Indians, the South Asia and the China and Japan and Korea. Everyone is important for us. Uh, that's our policy. We have demonstrated that, we have stated that and we have defended whenever some unfair accusation had been brought up against China. All right, uh, we have to leave it at that. Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ali Sabri, thank you very much uh, for uh, taking the time to speak to me. Uh, we're going to take a short commercial break. Back in a moment. were manipulated, influenced and forced by Western powers to get us to do their bidding. Unfortunately, all of that still continues. For them, Sri Lanka defaulting and going to the IMF is not the end game, rather far from it. To truly make sure Sri Lanka will never rise again, more permanent damage needs to be done. This brings me to a recent announcement the President made. The President has pushed a narrative in favor of the complete implementation of the 30th Amendment. This was announced during the Thaipong celebrations recently. It is interesting to look at issues like this because I don't know about you, but who is asking for this? It's clearly not the Tamil people in the North, clearly not the Tamil people in the midst of our country, clearly not the Tamil people of this nation. So where did, does this sudden issue of power devolution arise? And why has it been given prominence today amidst this entire economic crisis? Is it an election gimmick? Or is there more sinister 
motives lying underneath that claim. As we look to cure our economic ailments, we should remember that it shouldn't be at the cost of selling our souls to the devil. All solutions proposed for this country must be on our terms. And our leadership needs to understand that if they are willing to take that strength and converse with the international community, and for that, we the people will always be by their side. You may recall that former President Gotabe Rajpaksa pledged that he wouldn't hesitate to withdraw from any organization that bullies this country. Strong words. Words that I even defended. But given the last few months of his tenure, those words proved to be utterly useless. Just like his presidency, sadly. However, though it didn't hold value in terms of delivery, it still holds value in meaning. That is the grit and the position of strength Sri Lankan leaders should be used to negotiate with the world, not the role of a victim. This is where I appreciate President Rani Vikramasinghe when he told the US ambassador to go read their own co constitution, starting from Abraham Lincoln, before coming to lecture us. It is said that the victim mentality will have you dancing with the devil and then complaining that you're in hell. You and I are at that moment where we must rise to the occasion. Though the former president dropped the ball in establishing a legacy of his own and spat on the face of 6.9 million innocent individuals who trusted him with their lives and also fled the country in the middle of the night in shame, we don't have to do that. We have an opportunity to establish a legacy of real movement from the people to fix this situation so our future generations don't inherit the baggage of today. Now, on a programming note, make sure you listen to our podcast, which is released weekly. This week, we're talking about the US, the IMF, and the fake narrative. We were also joined by uh, Dr. Prithu Mahana Meheva. It was indeed a candid conversation, which you should certainly listen to. The State of the Nation podcast available on Apple Podcast and Spotify. I'm Mahesh Johnny. From all of us at Other Than 24, have a good night and a productive week. I'll see you back again next Sunday.